Okay, so then uh, we will start uh, for our first session, bioinformatics session. Um, for the first speaker, we have uh, Professor Majid Kazimian from Purdue University. Um, he's an assistant professor currently in uh, biochemistry and also computer science. And he has been working on COVID-19 and I, I know that he has some uh, seminal papers out recently. Uh, today we hear from him on dissecting biological pathways in COVID-19. Uh, Majid, please. Um, thank you so much, um, Daisuke, and thank you so much, Caitlin and Alessandra, for organizing this wonderful um, workshop. I hope that this is starting for many more to come. It, it's, it's really great. Um, and it's it's great to see all the participants and, and beautiful graphics of the virtual rooms. That's that's an amazing. So um, today I'm going to talk about three stories that we have been recently working on during this pandemic um, regarding COVID-19. But most importantly, I would like to acknowledge all the people who have worked on these three stories. Uh, many graduate student postdocs in my lab, um, a lot of collaborations from NIH, from different institutes of NIH, from Michigan State University, um, and, and, and people all across the world who have helped to build the three stories that I'm going to talk about. And then this would have not been, of course, possible without people, scientists willing to keep their data available even before their publication become available. And then these are terabytes and terabytes or hundreds of terabytes of data that scientists have produced in this short period of time. And of course, um, we are in depth to all the um, individual who unfortunately have lost their life during this pandemic. Um, so our lab is generally interested in studying host pathogen interaction using high throughput sequencing technology. <laughs> and just a 10,000 uh, foot view of the technology is that we have the cells, we extract either the DNA from the cells or RNA from the cells, and, and we take that and through a set of enzymatic reaction and amplification, we amplify either the DNA or RNA based on the need and we sequence it. And at the end of the sequencing, we get millions and, and billions of the short um, text um, sequences, which called reads, and, and then we get these reads and map them back to the genome or, or map them back to the um, genes and identify the uh, expression, mutation, and, and so on um, of, of the, of the uh, genes in the cells. So what we realized early on is that if we have the sequencing data, high throughput sequencing data from the infected host cells, these are the cells that let's say are infected with a virus or infected with a bacteria or, or any other pathogen. Of course, we could align these reads um, to the human genome or to the host genome and if we have a RNA sequencing, meaning that if we extracted the RNA and sequenced that, then we could identify the expression of all the host genes. If we have performed the DNA sequencing, then we could identify the mutation of all the host genes and genome. And through other technologies like chip sequencing, we could identify what are the regulatory mechanism uh, behind um, the specific biology uh, for this. But we could also, since these are the sequencing from the infected host cells, the material of the, um, the pathogen is also inside the cells and being sequenced. 
So we could use the same material to map it to the viral genomes or to the pathogen genome and study the expression of genes in the virus, the mutations of the genes of the virus, and if it's a DNA virus, we could study whether or not it's being regulated by a specific factor. And then now that we have from the same cell, have both information of the host and the pathogen, we could actually study the host pathogen interaction. For example, we could see whether or not an expression of a gene from a virus is correlated with the expression of the gene from the host. So with, that, with this realization, we developed a tool that could, with 100 specificity and almost sensitivity, could identify viral sequences from the high throughput sequencing data of the, of the infected host cells. And then we apply this to study different um, host pathogen interaction. Here, for example, I'm showing a map that, that shows that uh, a specific virus, Epstein-Barr virus, is integrated in a specific part of the human genome. Um, we use this approach to study um, liver cancers that are associated with hepatitis and so on. But when the pandemic started, um, we were tasked to identify specific biology related to this, to this COVID. So we had three questions that we wanted to know. What is the underlying biology? When it started, we didn't know much about it. And that could be answered using host virus interaction. How it's regulated when the virus goes inside the host, what are the biological processes that are being activated or repressed in response to this and how they are regulated? And of course, um, a million dollar question is that, is there anything that we could intervene? Are there any drugs um, that could alleviate the situation? So to answer the first question, um, we started with one of the most critical tools that we have to study and understand um, the outcome of high throughput sequencing data. And that's a pathway analysis. And the way that we do that is by comparing the gene expression of infected cells and non-infected cells and sorting all the genes uh, based on the genes that are more expressed in infected cells, all the way to the genes that are more expressed in uninfected cells. And then asking a simple question, are the genes that are more expressed in infected cells overlap significantly with a given biological pathway, meaning that there are more of the genes that are highly expressed in infected cells, and they overlap significantly with a given biological pathway. So to, using this so-called gene set enrichment analysis, we looked at the long of patients who unfortunately passed away uh, from this disease, and we compared their lung with the lung of the healthy individual um, and an identified pathways that are enriched specifically within the lung of COVID patients. And what was extremely unexpected for us was that we identified a pathway called complement pathway that becomes super activated within the lung of these patients. I'm gonna come back to that complement pathway and talk about it a little bit further um, down the slide. Just bear with me for a few seconds. But you may say that the lung of the patients are basically a heterogeneous set of cells that also have immune cells that infiltrated inside that 
and even long epithelial cells are not uniform. Um, is this because of the immune cells that are going in that we see these complement pathway activation? Or it's something that is local to the lung cells that they are starting to generate this pathway and component of this pathway. So to answer that, we looked at a range of the cells. These are lung epithelial cells that are infected with SARS-CoV-2 and we compare them with the non-infected control cells and again, what we saw is that the complement pathway is among the highly induced pathways. A549 cells are another long epithelial cells that are um, somehow resembling type two pneumocyte cells. And in them, again, complements are among the top. And if we overexpress the in entry receptor for SARS-CoV-2 um, and, and then check whether what are the pathways that are activated. Indeed, complement pathway become the top activated pathway uh, within these cells in response to SARS-CoV-2 infection. So just to summarize that, if we look at the lung of the patients and the pathways that are activated in response to SARS-CoV-2, or the long epithelial cells, different long epithelial cells, and, and identify the pathways that are indeed shared among the patients and different long epithelial cells that were infected with COVID, with SARS-CoV-2. And there are 14 pathways that are highly induced. Uh, among them, of course, interferon response pathways, those are Pathways that are in response to any infection would be induced, but also we observed complement related pathway among the top pathways that are induced. And, and then just um, a simple summary of what is complement system. It is one of the evolution, ancient evolutionary conserved part of our immune system, that the series of enzymatic reactions that basically are extremely pro-inflammatory and they are generally generated through tree route to fight different infection. And then all of these, I'm not gonna go to the detail, all of these routes lead to a specific key component, which is a C3. So it's a specific gene in this pathway that is being activated and it's a key. And that specific gene is cleaved to two components, C3A and C3B. And those two components themselves go and bind to a receptor on the cells that are expressing their receptors and engage a specific pathway. So C3A um, goes and binds to C3A receptor on generally specific set of immune cells and activated the downstream pathway on them. C3B also does the same, uh, goes and binds the CD46, another receptor in immune cells and activate that pathway. And all of this enzymatic reaction happens to be via a factor called complement factor B that basically generates a molecule that cleave the C3 to its own components. What was interesting about this was that this pathway was known to be active within the liver and all of the complement that was generated and going to our serum was through the liver generated serum. But it seems what we have found was that within the lung of the patients, this complement has been activated and there is a local hyper uh, activation of this pathway within the lungs of these patients.
So um, just going back to what we found, we found that there are complement related pathways among the highly induced pathways in response to COVID. Just this is an example showing that the genes that are more highly expressed in A549 cells that are infected with COVID or with SARS-CoV-2 compared to control A549 cells, those are more enriched in complement related pathways. And the top set of genes among them are complement related genes, including C3 and CFP, which is complement factor. And then of course, when we look at the expression of these factors across different cell lines and across different patients, COVID patients, we see that they are highly induced, both complement factor B and, and then C3 among them. So then one could say and, and, and argue that although you have shown that in the long epithelial cells, you see this activation of complement system, but long epithelial cells themselves are not quite uniform and then they are very heterogeneous. Uh, and and to, to explore that possibility, um, these days we have technologies of single cell type and then looking at the single cell gene expression. So we utilize that technology and we looked at the single cell um, RNA sequencing from human bronchial epithelial cell, long cells. Um, and, and using a single cell approach, we were able to identify eight different cell types within these epithelial cells. They are basal type cells, club cells, ciliated, and, and so on. But interestingly, all of these cells were exposed to SARS-CoV-2, i.e. this was the entire lung that was exposed to the SARS-CoV-2. However, what we saw was that four of these cell types were directly taking up the SARS-CoV-2 material or they are being infected by it. And four of them are, although they are exposed, they don't take up the SARS-CoV-2, i.e. they are bystander cells. And interestingly, within the infected cells, we saw that the complement pathway is highly activated, but the bystander cells are not activating um, that particular pathway. And it becomes extremely specific, as opposed to inflammatory response or interferon response, which was somewhat uh, promiscuous in, 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 in types of the cells that it was, it was present in. Um, just to summarize that, again, we saw that genes that are more highly expressed uh, in SARS-CoV-2 infected uh, bronchiepithelial cells are, are enriched in, in complement. C3 is among the top. And the C3, which was the main factor in this pathway, is highly induced in the cells that are indeed infected and not in bystander cells. So this suggests that maybe there is a direct correlation between the expression of C3 genes and the amount of the virus that goes inside the cells. So that's exactly what we decided to check and to do. So what we did, we looked at the, again, RNA sequencing from the lung of the patients that were, um, COVID, uh, that, were, that were COVID positive. And we observed that the level of virus is directly correlated with the level of the C3 in, in, in patients that are infected. And this was observed across all of the, not only patient lung, but all the cell lines that were infected with SARS-CoV-2. So this is great, um, but 
Then the question is, so far we have been looking on mRNA or, or RNA sequencing data, and then these are all happening at the RNA level. Does it happen at the protein level? Because most of the time, um, genes are induced, transcription of them are, are, are going on, and then they are, if they are coding genes, they are becoming translated to a protein, and the proteins are, are performing the function. So to study whether or not the proteins are also affected or, or the protein is also generated, we looked at um, the cells. Um, again, we had airway epithelial cells. These are long cells. And we infected these cells through a collaboration with Michigan University. We infected these cells with either, either mock or SARS-CoV-2, and we stand for two things. The N protein, which is the protein inside the virus or the, is a viral protein. So if there is an N protein, means that there is a virus that's infecting the cells. And if there isn't, means that there was no infection. And we also stain for the C3. So it's striking what we observed is that when there is no infection, there is absolutely no C3 production. And the cells that are infected strikingly upregulate the active form of C3 or C3A. And, and, and of course, we quantified this and we observed that there is a direct correlation between the intensity of viral protein and intensity of C3 level. So this was um, great. We now know that within the long epithelial cells, C3 is produced at both RNA level and protein level. Then um, the question was that, is this in happening inside the cells or it's something that coming from outside of the cells and going um, and then going into the cells. Um, to ask that question and see whether or not this is an intracellular, of course, um, we looked at this biological pathway and we knew that CFP or factor B is responsible to cleave the C3 molecule to true components and if we could have a inhibitor of this component, we'll know whether or not that happens inside the cells or outside the cells. And that's what exactly we did. Uh, we infect the cells and we see that the C3A goes up. And if we add the inhibitor of cell permeable inhibitor of, of factor B that cleaves the C3, then we realize that the C3 level goes down. So, um, this, was, this was great. So we have the C3 inside the cells. It's being produced according to all the pathways that we have analyzed. And now, if you remember, I mentioned that it generates two components and they go and, and act on their receptors on different cell types. So then the question is, are these engagement of the receptor happening in a living cells in vivo. So then to answer that question, again, we went back to our computational um, resources and we looked at the single cell RNA sequencing within the lung of patients that are uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2. So each dot in this, in this graph is a single cell, and the cells are clustered according how similar they are. And we were able to identify epithelial cells um, and lymphoid and myeloid cells. These are the cell types of immune system. And within the epithelial cells, we were able to identify type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes, especially type 2 pneumocytes are the ones that are major target of the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So, of course, we were um, showing that 
within the single cells, C3 was induced in 82 cells, um, but that was not the case. The case is that the C3 that is induced here and generates C3A and B, can those act on other cells within this through the receptor? And, and, and to answer that, we looked at the programs that are induced or biological pathway that are induced by the engagement of the C3A with its receptor or C3B with its receptor. And interestingly, this is what we found. The myeloid cells that are some part of immune cells that are actually upregulating the receptor for C3A, they have a gradual increase in expression of C3A related program in a dose dependent manner to the disease severity, meaning that those uninfected lung have very little expression of C3A related pathway. Patients with a mild disease have medium level of that and patients with severe, severe disease have strong activation of, of these uh, particular pathway that is complement driven. Similar thing for, for lymphoid cells. I'm not gonna go to the detail. Just to summarize this part of the story, we have shown that unexpectedly complement pathway is activated in response to SARS-CoV-2 infection within the lung epithelial cells of the patient and it's highly correlated with the viral load. And we have shown that it is processed to its active forms, and those active forms are actually in vivo contributing to the engagement of their receptors. And, and all of this, when we looked at the blood samples from the COVID patients or healthy donors, these signatures were not present, meaning that they were only present within the site of the inflammation, i.e. within the lung of, of these samples. So um, just to continue, we, we try to understand the host pathogen interaction using all of our high throughput sequencing. So the next question was, how this is regulated? And to answer that question, again, we looked at differentially expressed genes between SARS-CoV-2 infected cells and uninfected cells. There are about several hundred genes that are upregulated by SARS-CoV-2 um, in, in, let's say, different lung epithelial cells, and, and a fewer, fewer genes that are downregulated in response to SARS-CoV-2 infection. And our question was, are the genes that are regulated or induced by SARS-CoV-2, are all of them regulated by another factor, i.e. an upstream regulator, like a transcription factor, that suddenly upregulated a whole bunch of them? Um, and then just a reminder, our, this is our chromosome, there's a DNA on top, there are genes um, that are within our DNA, and then the transcription factor goes and binds somewhere near the genes and turn these genes on and off. So the question was, are there genes that are, are there, are there transcription factors that are regulating significant portion of these several hundred genes um, in, in, in terms of the SARS-CoV-2 response. And, and when we looked at those, we identified that there are about 10 transcription factors that are significantly regulate majority of these, um, these genes that are induced by SARS-CoV-2. In fact, five of these belong or belong to 
type one interferon response family transcription factor, and a few of them related to NF kappa B passphase. So it seems that there are two major passphase that are regulating the genes that are induced by SARS-CoV-2, interferon response pathway and NF kappa B pathway. And then, and of course, we confirm this by looking at the ChIP-seq data. These are, these are defining where these transcription factors bind, and we show that the genes that are induced by SARS-CoV-2 have much higher bound binding of STAT1 or REL A. These are the factors of interferon and NF kappa B pathway. This is just like the um, simple track showing that, um, let's say, next to CFB, there's a binding of STAT1, there's a binding of REL A, and, and these are the chip seek binding of H3K27 acetylation, i.e., this is a enhanced region where the transcription factors are coming and binding and, and regulating these genes. So just to summarize, we show that the complement pathway is activated in response to SARS-CoV-2, and it is STAT1 and NF-kappa B dependent. Um, so then the next question is, is there any way that we could intervene? To answer that, what we did is a simple computational approach. So we knew that in response to a viral infection, there are certain genes that are upregulated and there are certain genes that are downregulated. In fact, we showed that there are several hundred genes that are upregulated and several hundred genes that are downregulated. So then the question was, can we look at different drug database where we know the genes that are upregulated by a drug or downregulated by drug and match these two together, meaning that we, if we could find a drug that downregulate the genes that are upregulated by SARS-CoV-2 and upregulated the genes that are downregulated by SARS-CoV-2, we could potentially normalize um, the effect of the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So by this simple um, statistical and computational matching of the drug targets and infection uh, response targets, we were actually identified a range of the drugs. And on top of the drugs was a drug that was a JAK-STAT inhibitor drug. And remember that previously we have shown that many of these genes were related to JAK-STAT, were related to interferon response pathway that is regulated through JAK-STAT1. So an inhibitor of that is also very effective to normalize those genes. So to test that this is, this is reality, we indeed looked at the cells that are infected with SARS-CoV-2 in the presence or absence of this JAK-STAT inhibitor, or oxolitinib. And interestingly, the genes categorized as a following. The genes that are induced by SARS-CoV-2 but the drug has no effect on them, or the genes that are repressed by SARS-CoV-2 and drug has no effect on them. But there's a group of genes that are induced by SARS-CoV-2 and drug completely normalize them. And when we look at them, uh, these genes are um, JAK-STAT dependent and that the drug is inhibitor of JAK-STAT, and the other pathway is NF-kappa B dependent. The two major pathway that we identified were jak stat So we normalized one of them using one of the drug and the other one was not yet normalized. And among all the genes that we normalized were all of our complement related genes. So just to test this in, in the real setting, um, I have shown this before, when we infect cells with SARS-CoV-2, C3 level goes up. Um, if we have a CFB complement factor B inhibitor, we have gone down uh, and the C3 level goes down. Now, if we have only ruxolitinib or that JAK inhibitor, 
the C3 level also goes down significantly. But now if we combine it with an antiviral remdesivir, um, the C3 level that was induced in response to SARS-CoV-2 entirely disappears. So uh, with this, um, just to summarize it, what we have shown is that upon SARS-CoV-2 infection, um, there are a range of genes that are induced. Those belong to complement-related pathways. We have shown that they are depending on specific set of transcription factors, including STAT1 and RELA. And we have shown that the complement C3 is cleave to two active forms, C3A and B, and each of them act on their own cell types, the cells that express the receptor for them, i.e. C3A receptor and CD46 for C3B. And, and these engagement, hyperactivation of this engagement within the lung of the severe cases of COVID causes the tissue damage and high inflammation. And of course, we show that different part of this pathway um, that we identified um, could be stopped using either complement inhibitor or JAK-STAT inhibitor in combination with the antivirals. So um, now I would like to switch gear towards the second story. Um, and then that's about the C3B engagement with the receptor on immune cells, CD46, and how the downstream pathways of that are affected. So what we identified interestingly is that if we look at the T cells in the lung of the patients, um, and, and we look at the single cell RNA sequencing and dividing them, the typical CD4 cells, these are, these are part of our T cells. These T cells are extremely pro-inflammatory. So when we look at the pro-inflammatory program, we realize that these are becoming highly pro-inflammatory cells. So our question was, what is the pathway that is causing these pro-inflammatory reaction um, for, for the COVID, COVID cases. And remember that majority of the reason that the patients end up unfortunately um, succumb to death is, is the hyperinflammation within the lung and hyperactivation within the lung. So it's an important to identify why this inflammation or pro-inflammation, how it happens and then whether we can even intervene in that section. So we looked at the, again, the genes that inside the CD4 cells, meaning that inside the pro-inflammatory cells. And interestingly, what we identified was that there are a set of transcription factors we already knew about interferon transcription factors, stat transcription factors. We, we talked about them previously. But there are a vitamin D receptor related transcription factor that seem to be controlling a range of this inflammation. So that, is, that was very surprising to us that the vitamin D seems to be related to the inflammation in the T cells of the lungs of these patients. Of course, we experimentally confirmed that vitamin D receptor is induced by complement. And if we take the T cells from the healthy, activate them, may, making them extremely active, uh, and then put the vitamin D in them, we could switch them from being extremely active and inflammatory to anti-inflammatory. So um, 
when we looked at within the COVID patients long, what we found was that those genes that are typically repressed by vitamin D are now derepressed in the COVID patients' T cells. And that is directly correlated with the amount of pro-inflammatory cells that are within the lung of these patients. So what we, again, if we go back to our um, genes that are induced within the T cells of the lungs of these patients, and we decide to identify the drug that could normalize these genes, interestingly, the drugs that come up, two of them, these are the top 10 drugs, two of them belong to the active form of vitamin D, alpha-calcidiol, or, or active form of vi vitamin D, and a set of steroids that are commonly used now in uh, severe cases of COVID. So what we think is happening is that in a normal situation, when there's an infection, we have the T cells that are becoming inflammatory, and after a while, um, they become, they, they resolve the particular infection and they switch to anti-inflammatory phase. And what happens in the COVID is that this pro-inflammatory phase in, in the severe cases is not being shut off properly and it's not switching to the anti-inflammatory phase. And we think that a combination of vitamin D and steroids are the way to renormalize this program to make it to go back to anti-inflammatory phase. So in the next um, five or, or less minutes, I would like to switch gear to the third story on the subject. Um, and that's about a extremely controversial paper um, that came up um, a few months ago, actually at the end of last year in December, and claimed that SARS-CoV-2 could reverse transcribe itself and integrate into our genome. And this was highly controversial and, and it was extremely covered in, in all the news. However, the only evidence that they have provided in the COVID patients was that they said that they have observed some of these read sequencing reads that have, are partly from human and partly from SARS-CoV-2. So that was the only evidence with respect to this integration. So since we had a um, expertise in the area of this um, sequencing, we knew that whenever we have an RNA sequencing of infected cells, we could have the reads that are coming from the host. We could have the reads that are mapped to virus. We could have reads that are unmapped, and we could also have fusion reads. And fusion reads could be actual true real events, or sometimes they could be an artifactual events. The real events are when we have an integration, actual integration, somehow when we have the um, trans splicing or splicing event of the genes, or they could be artifactual. And then this is very actually common during the library construction. We do a range of, um, a range of enzymatic reactions inside the tubes to make these library and amplify them. So we asked whether or not um, these fusion reads that we have seen in these patients are real or artifact? Um, and then to answer that question, we have performed a lot of experiments, but I'm just going to present one of them. Um, and, and, and what we did was we had a libraries where we actually took 
RNA from unrelated species, fruit fly, just separate species and, and mix them with the RNA from the human inside the tube and then performed the library preparation and, um, and, and um, all, the, all the sequencing. So the idea being that if we identify any hybrid between the fruit fly and the human, that level of hybrid is going to explain, and that's an artifact which is created through this process. And that could be setting us a level of the noise that we expect from these technologies. And indeed, when we looked at those, it's about 1% of the reads are having this property, meaning that we expect that 1% of these fusion events to happen at a random case and be irrelevant because of the library profession. And when we looked at all of the patients and samples that are infected with SARS-CoV-2, the really, the amount was lower than this, meaning that all of the observations were below the noise level, or were, were basically at the noise level and were not distinguishable from the noise. And we tried to uh, show with different um, assays that these were actually artifactual. So what I'm just going to summarize is that we have shown, and, and there's a paper uh, that we have published that these events are actually infrequent. They cannot be reproduced. They are likely the artifact of enzymatic reactive uh, RT reaction during the library preparation. And we know this is what's happening, that during the library preparation, we have the reverse transcriptase which is supposed to go over the RNA to generate the DNA for the sequencing. However, once in a while, these are biological agents, so they are not completely faithful. They fall off from their original template and, and, and prime in another template, creating these um, ghosts of um, chimeric or fusion events. And we have shown that that is indeed the case in this particular, uh, in this particular manner. So we know that now that the evidence um, that has been, has been presented do not actually support any of these SARS-CoV-2 integration into the human genome. So um, this is an important because, because people were concerned about the safety of the mRNA vaccine and, and what we could say with, with extreme um, confidence is that there is no concern regarding any of these events happening actually within the patient samples. So with this, I would like to stop and um, open to any question. Thank you very much, Majid. Uh, it was a very fresh data and uh, important topic. Um, any question from the audience? I could stop sharing. Sorry, let me see whether I can. Okay, I have uh, one question. Uh, well, it's good to know that SARS-CoV-2 uh, genome is not integrated uh, <laughs> to our genome. Um, so, okay, so at the, uh, the first uh, half of your talk, you mentioned about C3 um, in uh, convertase uh, activation. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, well, naively, I had the impression that, uh, uh, well, SARS-CoV-2 will do many, many things, uh, unknown things, and uh, that makes uh, the damage to the, to the tissues and so on. But uh, is C3, um, you know, uh, major reason of the, the like lung damage or there are on also possibility of other factors involved? Very good question. I think that there are um, definitely possibility of other pathways being involved. However, um, it's 
how would you go and, and prove in, in a biology generally that something is the major factor? And then the way to do that was uh, basically taking this C3 out of the out of the equation and see whether or not these um, people who don't have the C3 would develop um, some sort of infection or would, would be responding to COVID. So what has happened is that in prior studies, when we look at the C3 deleted mice, meaning that the mice that do not have the C3 in their lung, they are highly resistant to infection, meaning that they don't get infected. So um, that, that to some extent shows that um, this is one of the major pathways that are um, defining the tissue damage within the lungs of these patients. And of course, because it's also active in many other organs, including our kidney, including our nervous system, um, it, it kind of makes sense why we have a lot of um, organs that are affected by this particular virus. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, any other questions? Um, I have a quick question. Um, Go on. You mentioned that the number of genes that are upgraded or regulated or downregulated or like a, the order of a couple hundred, um, is that high for a virus or like how does that fit into the scheme of of viral induced changes? It, it's, a, it's a great question. I think that that's about what we expect um, to some extent with any of the um, general respiratory related viruses. So when they infect the cell, generally they would change a couple hundred genes upregulated or downregulated. Typically those genes are expected to fall into the inter response pathway or interferon response pathway, which is the pathway that it's um, activated in response to any infection. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that's kind of expected. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, Thomas, you have a question? Yes, hi. Uh, I, my, my question is regarding the, the first part of your talk. So you, um, you showed uh, some results for A549 and the same cell lines expressing, expressing AC2 receptor. Mm -hmm. And I, when, when you showed that heat map, it, it had quite different outputs of, of uh, the pathway analysis. And I was wondering, can you, can you speculate what, what, is there any, any alternative entry mechanism or a different, um, what could be reason of that? It, it's a very, very good question. So I think that um, there are co-entry um, mechanisms that are um, discovered for, for SARS-CoV-2. And ACE2 was one of the major entry mechanisms, but there are also other receptors that help to take SARS-CoV-2 in. Um, the, the fact that when you overexpress uh, the receptor in the cells, sometimes a lot of additional um, stuff happens within the cells. And sometimes the overexpression of it kicks in another pathway within the cells and then trying to shut down some other, other downstream mechanism to prevent uh, to prevent overactivation. That's why sometimes when you are utilizing these uh, overexpression systems, they show different pathways or they show a little bit different response. I hope I, I was able to respond to your question because we could discuss a little bit more detail. Okay, thank you. Um... Any other quick question, if anyone has? Uh, 
All right, then uh, let's thank uh, the speaker, uh, Majid, again. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Thanks, Aisha. Thank you, everyone.